Good evening and welcome everyone to this discussion between two of our most distinguished and esteemed commentators on the prospects for hope following the Paris COP21 agreement of 195 nations to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius, aspiring to 1.5 degrees. My name's Liz Connor and I'm a recent ARC Future Fellow at La Trobe University where I did my PhD, so I'm very happy to be here. At this timely discussion, because the dilemma we face, face tonight is that the latest findings announced by climate scientists this week uh, shows that the two degree target has already been breached across the Northern Hemisphere, barely three months after the Paris talks closed. And that February was the hottest month on record after January, which was also the hottest month by a wide margin, but February temperatures have uh, just run away. And that the Great Barrier Reef is undergoing a severe bleaching event, among other fairly terrifying announcements. Meanwhile, within barely a week of his return, our newly minted Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, approved the second coal port terminal at Abbott Point. A month before, during a tour of the Pacific Islands of all places, Bill Shorten, our opposition leader, declared Labor will continue coal mining. 100 climate scientist positions have been slashed from the CSIRO. To me, it seems Orwellian. It is impossible to keep abreast of these revelations without feelings of vertiginous despair and brimming wrath. What are we supposed to do with this information? Is it prudent or burdensome to tell our children? How might we galvanise a city, a civil society response between the twin paralysis of apocalyptic helplessness and false hope? There is much to consider tonight. Not the least whether the tanking price of thermal coal will provide the market impetus for a rapid and urgent transition to renewables. But perhaps the overriding question for tonight is, what are the probabilities now for mitigation and adaptation? And does the COP21 agreement provide any kind of roadmap into these historically unprecedented um, circumstances? Here on my right uh, are two fellows who need no introduction, but um, for the sake of formalities. Robert Mann is Emeritus Professor of Politics and Vice Chancellor's Fellow at La Trobe University. He is the author and editor of over 20 books and three quarterly essays, notably his Left, Right, Left, now the title of a blog devoted to political orienteering at The Monthly, where he has acted as chairman of the editorial board. Twice voted Australia's leading public intellectual, Robert has rebutted both climate and stolen generations denialists unrelentingly. Clive Hamilton is Professor of Public Ethics at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at Charles Sturt University in Canberra and author of, among 14 books, Earthmaster, Requiem for a Species, Affluenza and Growth Fetish. He founded and was Executive Director of the progressive think tank, the Australia, Univ uh, the Australia Institute. Perhaps one hope we can carry away from this evening is that Robert and Clive's books and essays, and I pinched this idea from a review by Tim Flannery, their books and essays are stacked on the prosecutor's bench when plaintiffs from the next generation file a class action lawsuit against the federal government for failing negligently to reduce emissions. And before I hand over, I also want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nations as original custodians of the land on which we meet, but with particular emphasis tonight on the meeting of custodianship and how indigenous knowledge, such as oral histories accounting for sea level rises 7,000 years ago, can, be, can inform and be part of any such discussion. Please join me in welcoming Robert Mann and Clive Hamilton. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Um, I just say for the uh, people here that um, Liz will come back on stage, that's why there's a third chair, um, and ask Clive and perhaps me some questions about what we've said. So um, when Clive and I have um, kind of finished our conversation, Liz will return. Um, it's great to have um, someone from La Trobe, someone with already a very distinguished academic career introduce us tonight. Um, and then, of course, there'll be time for, for questions from the floor, which Liz, Liz will take. So it's a great pleasure for me to have convinced a good friend of mine, Clive Hamilton, to, to come here tonight. Clive had a very important uh, impact on me when, much too late in the piece, I suddenly realised that this was 
climate change was an issue larger than any, any that I'd ever thought about. And he has been following uh, climate change for at least, I'd say, 20 years or longer. Um, and I, he was my first choice when I was thinking about doing something after Paris because there's no one, literally no one, um, in Australia whose judgment and whose honesty um, I value more highly. So thank you for coming, Clive. Um, I've got a series of questions. Um, they're, they're big questions. Uh, and um, the first one I want to ask is, um, I, a lot of people here will know, not everyone, that um, at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, um, each year for many, many years now, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is measured. And almost, I think, without exception, every year since the measurements began, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased, um, despite all the politics, despite all the efforts that have been made. And I suppose the, question I, the first question I want to ask Clive to talk about, which is a very big question, is if this continues, if carbon dioxide continues to increase in the atmosphere alongside other greenhouse gases. Um, give us a pen portrait of what's going to happen to our planet. Well, uh, the um, secular increase in uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, grows apace. In fact, um, as you know, it went up uh, three parts per million last year, whereas for a long time it has been around about two parts per million. So from that point of view, things are getting worse. And so uh, if you look at the uh, famous chart, you see this uh, increase in concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And for quite a long time in the science community and indeed in international negotiations, uh, people um, talked about uh, as kind of targets or things to worry about uh, uh, was certain levels of uh, parts per million, 350, 400, which we've just gone through, and then future projections of 500 and even 600. Um, but more recently, climate scientists have started to talk about uh, the degrees of warming associated with concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And a lot of this, I think, was driven by the, uh, the decision, uh, it was driven by the decision uh, by... Um, the EU several years ago uh, to set a target or guardrail, as it's known, of, of limiting warming to two degrees. And that's now very much um, what the global community has adopted and reaffirmed uh, in Paris. Although, importantly, and perhaps we'll talk about this, Paris for the first time uh, acknowledged the uh, demand of the small island states that um, uh, an attempt be made to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. The commitments that various countries have made leading into Paris would, if honoured, uh, see warming limited to three degrees. Uh, if those commitments aren't honoured, then we're perhaps looking at a world warming by four degrees. But when I talk in those terms of degrees, it's actually very misleading because the world, even if it were committed and did all the actions it wanted to do, could not limit warming to three degrees. Because once you get beyond two degrees, and possibly even at, not possibly, but quite likely even at two degrees of warming, you essentially lose control of the climate system. Because the, uh, the climate system will cross uh, a number of tipping points, and the ones most often mentioned, the big tipping points, are the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, vast uh, masses of ice. Um, that once they start melting, you can't stop them. And over centuries, they will continue to melt until they're all gone. And the melting of those ice sheets will have a, uh, have a profound impact on the climate. And this is why climate change is, of course, profoundly unlike every other environmental issue uh, that has come before. Because the greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere now, particularly carbon dioxide, they stay there, or at least they stay in, um, in the Earth system. They're mobilised in the Earth system, whether the carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere or in the oceans or possibly in the biosphere. And so 
if we go beyond uh, two degrees, and certainly if we go to three degrees, then we'll almost certainly go to four degrees and beyond. And then we're kind of off the scale. I mean, some people say, well, you know, in five hours' time, it's going to be four degrees cooler. You know, what are you worried about? Uh, but in fact, during the last ice age, when New York was a mile under ice, the Earth was five degrees cooler than it is now, or was at pre-industrial levels. So these temperature changes represent a massive change in the climate system and therefore the functioning of the Earth system. That's why climate scientists are so anxious, because we are losing control of the climate system. We're aiming to limit warming to two degrees, but there's good evidence that uh, the warming already at 1.6 degrees and we're probably locked in 2.4 degrees. So we really are in deep trouble. And of course, with those kinds of warmings, 2.43 degrees, you get all that uh, catalogue of catastrophes which will in time make large parts of the Earth uninhabitable and all of the kind of geopolitical consequences that would follow. Yes. Um, and it's when I realised that, that I, I began to see that this was a problem that made all other problems um, seem small in scale. The, f the first, uh, and when I, when I think we began to talk about this issue, we were, you before me, but we were both believers in Kyoto as a, a road towards some possibility of, of uh, coping with the problems you've just outlined. Yes. Very briefly, if you could say, what did Kyoto try to do? And I think you'd agree, why did it fail? <laughs> Well, Kyoto was uh, the, a protocol to the, the, the kind of mother convention, the framework convention signed in 1992. Kyoto was a protocol to it in 1997, which um, was legally binding uh, on all the signatories, or at least those countries that ratified it, um, and imposed a legally binding obligation on rich countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by certain negotiated amounts actually in Australia, allowed Australia to increase its greenhouse gas emissions, one of only two countries that managed to uh, secure that. Um, um, developing countries had other lesser obligations. Uh, the United States, um, because already then the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Senate was stacked full of conservatives, uh, refused to ratify the convention, which wasn't a great surprise. Uh, and then Australia too decided the Howard government decided, I think it was in 2002, that although it, that government had agreed at Kyoto in 1997 to, uh, uh, to commit to it, um, decided to repudiate that. And those actions seriously undermined uh, the, that, uh, that Kyoto protocol. The, the protocol did actually come into force. It was Russia, I think, that ratified it, that made it enter into force, I think in 2005. But by then it was a dead duck. And um, there are a lot of reasons why it didn't work. Uh, but let me just make this comment, that certainly I've completely changed my understanding of, of international politics and what is possible under international law as a result of Kyoto and its failure to follow through with the really quite uh, bold and in a way utopian um, uh, ambitions of that, uh, of that uh, uh, protocol. And the, and the years since perhaps the early 2000s, certainly the mid-2000s, have been a groping to, by the international community towards some other uh, kind of uh, treaty. And so there was a major shift from legally binding obligations to what is known uh, and what is now embedded in the, uh, uh, in the Paris Agreement as a pledge and review system. Yeah, I mean, what I'd like you to do, because not everyone here will know, is the Kyoto sort of hope, I think everyone would sort of agree, died at Copenhagen, um, when, and Paris was, is, is a quite new pledge and review system, as you yes. say. Not everyone will know what is entailed in pledge and review. No. And what, I mean, the, the simple question I want to ask yes. you is, is what were the main decisions that made, I mean, you know, I won't forget the film of the audience, including very significant figures, cheering when finally the agreement was made in Paris. In Paris. Um, not everyone knows what was agreed. And yes. if you could summarise um, 
that what you think to be the most important agreements that were cheered by Al Gore and by Nicholas Stern and others. Well, they not only cheered, these, um, they hugged each other and kissed each other. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary scene. Um, um, it was a euphoria in the hall and thereafter. And the contrast was very, very profound with Copenhagen. I have to say, you were there. I was there, uh, but not in the hall, I should say, when the final gavel came down. That was kind of official delegates only. Um, but Copenhagen 2009 was when kind of everything collapsed. It was a disaster from every point of view. And um, everyone in, involved in climate change uh, nationally and internationally, I think it's probably true to say, went into a very deep depression for some six or 12 months and gradually dragged themselves back. And, um, and, and learned a lot of lessons about building consensus, uh, which the French followed through brilliantly in the lead up to the Paris negotiations. And what died at Copenhagen finally was the idea that nations would uh, commit themselves to reduce emissions in a way that was legally binding under international law. Everybody kind of said that is not going to work. And I think that for the international legal scholars really changed the way they thought about it. Instead, a kind of weaker process, uh, but nevertheless a more successful one, was instituted, and that is where each country would come to the negotiations, as they did at Paris, having made a pledge. That is, making their own assessment based on their national circumstances as to what they believe they can do or are willing to do over the next 10 or 15 years to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And crucially, um, what happened in this process is that it wasn't just rich countries that uh, agreed to make a pledge, but in fact developing countries did too. And so they came to Paris, and this is actually probably the most important reason for the success of the Paris Conference. They came to the conference already having made their pledges, formally, officially, lodged them with the UN, this is what we're going to do, and, and from just as an aside, this is quite an extraordinary event in itself, that 195 nations, pretty much every nation in the world, made a formal pledge in public uh, for its national plans to reduce its emissions and, in fact, transform its economies. And then what did happen as part of that process uh, at Paris was an agreement on the review process. So countries made their pledges and then they agreed, and this is legally binding in the Paris Agreement, uh, to come back in five years' time with a review and, it's assumed, stronger pledges to reduce their emissions uh, in the future. Legally binding but unenforceable, presumably. Well, I mean, a lot of people say this is a waste of time. It's, you know, there's nothing, you know, it's legally binding on paper only. Uh, nothing can be done to enforce it. But this is international law. I mean, that's the case with every international law. I mean, I can't th think of an exception. Perhaps the that is, uh, international like criminal law. Like all international court, law, is unenforceable. It's unenforceable, um, but that doesn't mean that it's powerless. No, no. Um, and so, yes, uh, legally binding doesn't have the same force as you know passing a law in Australia, and the police will come and nab you if you break the law. But nevertheless, there are certain aspects of the Paris Agreement which are legally binding, uh, although the pledged emission reductions are not. Now, one of the things that interests me a lot about the um, Paris Agreement, and in a way the response to Paris, is how different the responses of the people I think both in you, you and I have admired, how different their responses have been to the Accord. And, and the, the, one of the divisions that interests me a lot, and I think, in a way, I think your writing is beginning to think about this division a bit implicitly, the division between the politically minded advocates like Al Gore, Nicholas Stern, uh, Mary Robinson, who was in Melbourne anyhow a day or so ago, the politically minded advocates and the scientific advocates like um, the most famous of all, probably James Hansen, formerly of NASA, but someone who had a big effect on you once, Kevin Anderson from yes. Tyndall Centre. Yes. They have taken, they're utterly pessimistic about the Paris Agreement Whereas, I mentioned earlier, I saw Al Gore and Nicholas Stern together cheering as the gavel went down. What's going on? Why are people 
I think, I think that most of us would respect greatly who have been at the forefront of fighting in this campaign, this battle for the future of the earth. Why are they so divided, do you think? What, what, and particularly why the scientific as against the politically minded divide? Well, um, I don't think it's quite as blunt as that. Um, uh, what we saw in, in the, uh, first of all, virtually everyone involved in the international negotiations, including the NGOs, um, were euphoric about the outcome of, of Paris. They all believed that um, it was pretty much the best one could possibly have hoped for for uh, an international negotiation, um, the 21st Conference of the Parties to the Framework Convention. And yet there were certain uh, powerful voices, uh, widely reported, um, who condemned it. And they were, in particular, uh, the two you've mentioned, uh, James Hansen and Kevin Anderson, extremely eminent scientists. Kevin Am Anderson, in particular, had a huge influence on me. It was his work that led directly, very directly, to me writing my book, Requiem for a Species. Um, uh, Kevin Anderson made the extraordinary statement that the Paris outcome was worse than Copenhagen. And uh, Hansen was all over the newspapers saying that uh, the agreement was a, a fraud, a fake, uh, w and worthless words. And I think what that reflects is, is a certain amount of political naivety on their part. The question is, well, what did you expect? I mean, you know, and they actually expected that all of the uh, negotiators from around the world, all of their supporters, their leaders, their so on, would, would come and they'd say, the science has spoken, you know, we will, we will mandate emission reduction paths for all countries and the world to meet the target of two degrees or preferably 1.5. Well, that was never going to happen. It couldn't happen. Um, and so rather than dividing between uh, the politicians or the politically oriented and the scientists, I think you have to divide between, between those who are politically savvy and those who really don't have a good understanding of how politics works and therefore what to expect. And I would put Kevin Anderson and particularly um, Hansen in that, uh, who, in, in that category. I mean, Hansen kind of bangs the table and says the only answer is a compulsory, compulsory globally agreed, very stiff carbon tax. We must have it. Well, dream on. Um, you know, this is hard negotiations. And so what we had, there was a fascinating side event. You know, there are the official negotiations, you know, this vast uh, uh, conference complex at Le Bourget on the, on the, on the uh, outskirts of Paris. And in addition to the official negotiations, um, uh, equally interesting was what happened outside the official negotiations. We'll talk about those, I'm sure. But one of the most fascinating events was on the Friday before the gavel came down on the Saturday. At the, actually, the conference was due to end at midnight on Friday, but uh, they never do. And so what they do as midnight approaches is that they order that the clock be stopped and so they can carry on negotiating without breaching uh, the midnight deadline. And so the gavel came down, I think, at 2 o'clock on Saturday. But on the Friday, as this tremendous kind of excitement and tension was gathering. There was a draft agreement which turned out to be virtually the same as the final agreement. There was a side event held. And um, it was by the, for the scientists. And it was packed. I mean, you couldn't get in. The security guards stopped people getting in. Just, the, just for scientists. Just for scientists. And they had, uh, I was just making a note from my notes, um, they had five of them lined up, extremely eminent, Totally believable people get the science, have a big influence. And we had, and let me say it wasn't quite like this, but let me say kind of on the left, if you like, Kevin Anderson. And uh, Kevin was saying things that this agreement has no teeth, it's worse than Copenhagen, we must have dramatic cuts now. Then in the middle, we had uh, um, John Schellenhuber extremely eminent uh, climate scientist, German, very big influence on Angela Merkel, um, highly regarded uh, operator, player behind the scenes. He was saying that, of course, the, 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 the current text is not strong enough, but it will send a very strong message uh, to business that uh, 
uh, the tables have been turned or the, a, a, point, a turning point has arrived and things are going to change. And kind of nearby him, you had Will Steffen, of course, very eminent Australian climate scientist. He said the real work will now begin after Paris. And then there was an, another expert from climate analytics. Then over on the right, if you like, uh, there was uh, Johan Rockstrom from the Stockholm Centre, who took a very kind of optimistic view that uh, uh, we can solve this problem, uh, everything's going well, and so on. And so here you had five scientists, very eminent, very well qualified, who took a range of views. And I would say that Shellen Huber and uh, the couple around him, including Will Steffen, had both an extremely solid understanding of the science, but also a good sense of what the, poli what, what the politically possible was. And they, they saw Paris as a, as a very, very positive outcome. Whereas I think Kevin Anderson and uh, James Hansen were, were, were demanding the impossible and therefore saying this is a terrible agreement. Yeah. I mean, I have a slightly different take on this, but um, in that one of the ways of looking at it is that to agree with you that Kevin Anderson and James Hansen are politically naive, but in a way, what, because they're politically naive, naive, they may be saying what has to be done if the, the portrait you paint or pen portrait you painted at the beginning is to be avoided, and that those who are politically savvy, um, who understand it will never happen, are also, as it were, um, changing, or well, not changing, but, but uh, not fully allowing the science to dictate what they think must happen. They realise it won't happen, so they, they, they're finding ways of being optimistic. Well, look, that's true. And, and, and uh, Kevin Anderson and James Hansen and one or two others have an extremely important role to play. They're, they're the kind of, you know... He, the, he, was, the, he was also politically naive in 2009 when he had the influence on you, don't you think? Uh, well, I was reading his science, his science of carbon budgets, and the, you know, what his, the way he presented the science had a huge impact because... Of, I, I, for the first time, fully understood uh, the, the awful situation that we were now in, based on CO2 emissions and, 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 and where we're headed, even under the most optimistic assumptions about where uh, global politics uh, might take us. So... I mean, if I can ask you, yeah. the, the, the big question with your writing, really, is... You started writing from Paris for Conversation, the, the website from the university. is a very good website. And there I was surprised to see a new Clive Hamilton who was reasonably optimistic about the future after Requiem for a Species, which probably was a book that had a very large effect on many people, including very eminent people, because you faced you know, what was really um, a very d dark future and you faced it I think more honestly than anyone else has. Um, and, but I was impressed with the arguments you began to put in the conversation, and I wonder if you could reprise them here and talk a little bit about the change in you um, in regard to this. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, I certainly haven't done any kind of volt farce, and my, my, my comments on what we're looking at down the track and the amount of warming and the, our inability to, to set the thermometer at you know, three degrees or even 2.5 degrees because the Earth system will have crossed tipping points that, over which we have no control. They're just too big and too massive and they operate on a century's time scale, a millennial time scale. Um, but what I saw at Paris, uh, and, and of course we all went there with, still with this kind of dreadful shadow of Copenhagen hanging over us and the prospect of a catastrophic failure once more. Um, what I saw at Paris was really something I didn't expect at all. I mean, one was the agreement itself. But what actually impressed me a lot more, or had a greater impression on me, was what was happening outside of the official negotiations. Um, in particular, what was happening in, uh, amongst what are known as non-state actors? And they cover um, cities and NGOs and uh, large organisations, non-commercial ones. And there, there's an amazing amount of things that are happening, kind of, 
huge cities around the world uh, taking on, you know, and let's face it, most of the emission reductions have, are going to have to happen in cities. You know, that's where the buildings are, that's where the transport is, and so on. But in a way more impressive to me was I'm a pretty close observer and, and quite a cynical one, I have to say, of the business community. I mean, I actually, I'm ashamed to admit it, 10, 12 years ago, I believed, half believed at least, that when BP rebranded itself as Beyond Petroleum, I thought this was something really important that was, you know, did signal something extremely significant within the, in the oil industry. What a fool I was. Uh, you know, when BP started to drill in the Arctic and, you know, buy up every oil well and gas facility it possibly could, it was a cynical, desperately cynical PR exercise by BP. But what I saw at uh, Le Bourget was really something quite different. And that was, um, in a nutshell, um, but let, me, let me try and paint a little picture. I went to another side event, which was uh, at which, and it was packed, some 400 people, you couldn't, no one could get in after it. And it was, it was uh, the, the people up front like this, although far more eminent, were Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, and um, Bloomberg, the New York billionaire uh, and media magnate. And, and, and almost president. And quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was thinking of running, but he's hey, pulled out. He, uh, definitely, as you put yeah. it. Yeah. Um, well, um, so Mark Carney was there, and he was talking about uh, the, uh, the way in which the central bankers of the world uh, have a new worry, uh, and that is that the, uh, the, the switch to renewable energy and out of the traditional fossil fuel industries may well soon be, be so abrupt, uh, there will be so many stranded ass assets and so much collapse in the value of massive corporations, certain massive corporations around the world, that it will spark a global financial collapse. And so the G20 finance ministers had instructed Mark Carney, who was the chair, chairperson of the uh, Financial Stability Board, which brings together the central bankers around the world, to write a report on how to manage what he called, what Carney called an ordered transition to a zero carbon economy. And I thought, wow. The central bankers are now involved. And I looked around this room of some 400, and virtually all I could see was suits. And I had never seen anything like that at a conference of the parties before. And this followed another very big event uh, for institutional investors. And there we heard the managers, the CEOs, of, and so on, of these massive investors. And they're not you know, piddly green ethical investors. I mean, these are the big pension funds. You know, these are the guys that don't talk in billions, they talk in trillions. And they're talking about how they are reorienting their investment, not tomorrow, but over the next few years, towards renewable energy, away from fossil fuels. They recognise the risk. It's not as though these guys, and women in some cases, had some kind of ethical epiphany, you know, looked into their grandchildren's eyes and said, I've got to become a good person and get out of fossil fuels. They could see a hard business case for change. And this shift in the, not so, oh, I don't call it the business community, although it's that, but in the investor community, has happened, I'd say, over the last 12 months. Uh, something happened. There was some kind of turning point that happened. And, and yet, I mean, the fossil fuel companies kind of haven't realised it because they go on. I read every day about their explorations and, you know, Liz mentioned in the introduction that neither political party here um, has the gumption to talk about the end of coal. Uh, and there is drilling in the Arctic. Um, Obama's slightly against it. But they seem to me, this is one of the problems I ha have as a thinker, trying to work out what's going to happen to our planet, is it's so easy to, if you're an optimist or a pessimist, to find evidence that suits your case. I mean, I, I, the way I'd illustrate it is uh, in the last few days, on the one hand, the fact has already been mentioned that there was a three parts per million increase in 2015. But I read this morning just on the ABC website 
uh, that the International Energy Agency says that in 2015, for the second year in a row, there was a slight decoupling of the growth of emissions, um, which were stable, from the growth of the economy, which increased by 3%. Yes. Here are two facts. Pessimists would take one, yes. optimists the yes. other. Yes, yes. And, but I think there are hundreds of relevant, really important, big relevant facts. There are. And how does one, how does one, your judgment now is, is sort of, uh, the, um, is on the, these meetings in Paris, which I was very interested in hearing about and which have a strong effect on me, but there are other kinds of important facts, like I read every morning about um, the work of the fossil fuel corporations, and not one government has yet, as far as I can see, said to a fossil fuel corporation, stop, we won't allow you to explore or ex uh, exploit the fossil fuel resources. Well, how does one form judgment um, when, when the possibility of pessimism or optimism is so uh, omnipresent, as it were? Well. I think, I think this is why my view has shifted somewhat, because I think the world has changed. Uh, and I think, you know, at last, after watching this and being engaged in it for 20 years, I get the sense that it, new possibilities have opened up. I mean, there are obviously other things happening as well, one of which, well, two of the most important are the dramatic decline in the cost, cost. of renewables. And the other is the extraordinary transformation of China's position. And China, in a way, is... China is by far the most important player now. Um, I mean, they screwed the world at Copenhagen. Now China is leading the world. I mean, it's, it's not quite as simple as that. So we're in this kind of point of transition. And we're going to have a whole lot of conflicting information, conflicting data, which is very hard to sort through. And, you know, frankly, my mood changes every day, sometimes several times a day, <laughs> depending on, you know, uh, what, I, what I've just read. And, you know, for uh, people who are really engaged in this, I mean, I think the only thing to do is to, is to not, you know, cherry pick or focus on particular facts because it's too hard, but to pick people you trust. Uh, people who have a really good, solid understanding of the science, who are intimately engaged in this, who also understand the politics of it, uh, and also understand, you know, the business operations of business. And so, um, the people I read with, I mean, I read a lot of people, but the ones that uh, whom I take mo most notice of are people like Joe Rom at uh, Climate Progress, uh, Dave Roberts at Vox. Um, and Mark Hertzgard uh, at Nation. I mean, three Americans, but kind of at the heart of the beast. And these are just three analysts who I find have a really fantastic grasp. I mean, and, I mean they shift their views, particularly Dave Roberts, who's a very kind of honest person who says, you know, I'm confused, um, and I like that. But my sense is, as someone who watches this closely, is that We've reached some kind of turning point, and this gives in me a sense that it is possible, for the first time that's possible, that we could limit warming, say, to 2.5 degrees, you know, if we're lucky. I mean, in Requiem for a Species, I was saying if we're lucky, we'll limit it to 4 degrees. But so much has happened in the last five years in, in the energy industries and in the last year or so in the investor community and in certain key political constituencies, notably China, that, you know, my view of where the world is going or where the world could go has changed quite markedly. Can, I, can we go briskly through a, a number of more concrete and obvious political problems facing the area? Um, perhaps the first I want to tackle something that you are interested in, and it's not, I think, discussed enough when climate change is discussed, which is population increase. Mm. We know that, well, demographers tell us, and we have to, well, I have to rely on them because it's not, a, not something I know nothing about um, as, as, uh, personally. They say that um, by 2050, there'll be two billion extra human beings on Earth. It's not a long time. Um, and that seems to me obviously will put a, a, a great pressure on energy that if the transition is not full 
by 2050, then you can just tell that if coal and oil and gas is still being used, as it might very well be, uh, there'll be a heck of a lot more coal and oil and gas needed to meet the needs, particularly as the industrial revolution becomes more fully globalised. It's now, Asia's been transformed uh, to a large extent. Eventually, I imagine Africa will feel the weight of industrial revolution. Industrial revolution could almost be called thus far the fossil fuel revolution. But what will two billion extra people do, do you think? Um, there are certain African countries that are, are adopting a very progressive position. And it's a bit like, you know, it's like, um, you know how some developing countries are kind of s skipping the landlines and going straight to mobile phones? Well, there are some African countries, and, and not just African countries, that are going to skip the fossil fuel stage and go straight to renewable energy and investing very heavily in it. That's not going to uh -huh. save, save us, but it's a very, uh, in itself, but it's a very significant uh, development. You know, one can only hope that India might uh, start to go down that path. India is a kind of complex uh, and, and worrying circumstance. But on the population question, I mean, it really depends, you know, as I've always said, it's not the number of people, I mean, it, the number of people matters, but what matters more is how much they consume. Uh, the composition of what they consume and the emissions intensity of their consumption. And, you know, in a way, the only hope uh, with this uh, extra 2 billion people on top of the uh, 7 billion we have already is that, um, you know, by that stage, by certainly by 2050, there will be um, zero carbon energy systems around the world. I mean, uh, I mean, those two billion people will consume a lot of other resources, uh, but with luck, their uh, greenhouse gas emissions will be will be very low. Let's hope. Yeah. Um, another question, which I know both of us are very interested in, a much more political question. We're at the moment watching what I regard as an utterly grotesque bid for the Republican nomination in the U.S. presidency. Um, I. It, Literally, I would fall off my chair if anything was said by one of the Republican candidates that made even minimal sense in the area of climate change. Mm. It's wall-to-wall -wall denialism yes. in the most important country in the world still, or the most powerful, in one of the two political parties, which will certainly control parts of Congress in the future and may even uh, one day produce the president. Yes. Um, how important is that as a fact in, in, you know, in my pessimist, optimist kind of story about what's going to prevail? How, how, and denial, I mean, people here might know that only a few days ago at the New South Wales Liberal Party conference, uh, two-thirds um, demanded a debate about the science. Um, and that's, you know, the most important state in our country and Liberal Party, which is in government, yes. and, which seems to have our Prime Minister, by the short and curlies. Um, how important is denialism, in the States in particular? Well, it has been vital. I mean, <coughs> vitally damaging uh, for, for a very long time. Um, I'd point out, though, that um, throughout the 90s and early 2000s, uh, denialism was a classic industry-funded campaign like the t tobacco campaign. Uh, it was created uh, in the back rooms of PR companies, uh, funded by fossil fuel uh, companies, um, prosecuted through uh, well-funded right-wing think tanks and conservative organisations, certain media outlets. And it only became a kind of mass movement, as it were, when that um, industry-funded, particularly Exxon-funded, uh, climate denial uh, campaign was taken up by the Tea Party. And so as late as around about 2010, Sarah Palin was saying, you know, we should have an emissions trading system. So it's a very kind of recent uh, phenomenon. But as you know, it's, 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 not, it's a cultural phenomenon. It's a marker of, uh, of one's uh, political and social cultural uh, position. But what's happening, we could talk about that forever, but what I think more interesting is that the world is finding ways of going around it. You know, it's there, it will dominate the US Senate and possibly even the House for a long time. 
Um, and it's, it's a huge roadblock. But as with all roadblocks, people start to find a way around it, as Obama has using administrative action and the, and the EPA, and which um, even in the United States, there are even Republican governors of certain states who are strongly in favour of renewable energy. I mean, Texas, for example, has a huge renewable energy industry. Uh, the renewable en energy industries in the United States now employ more people than the fossil fuel industries. And so, you know, the, 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 the politics of this behind what the Republic Republicans are doing is really uh, changing, I think, in, in quite a significant way. And I think what we will see is that even some of the more hardline uh, denialists uh, in, in senior levels of the Republican Party looking for ways to get out of this terrible kind of bind that they've, they've got them into and which has been so massively damaging. Another completely separate question. Um, that worries me is the pledge and review system of Paris, which you talked about. Um, I, I cannot believe that some nations will not just break their pledges, even though under law they have to, in five years, as it were, talk about what they've done so far. It, it's inconceivable to me that everyone will meet their targets. And I've looked at some nations and what, what they said they're going to do and what they're likely to do is completely out of whack. Um, Turkey is one that I've looked at just by accident. I read something. Um, what happens when some, even some significant nations, begin to show that the pledges they've made are not going to be held to? What, what, what should be done, what will be done, do you think? Because that, that seems to me the, the main vulnerability of the Paris Agreement. Well, um, yes, indeed, and, and indeed, Kyoto, I mean, uh, even under legally binding provisions of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, when the United States refused to ratify and Australia refused to ratify and Canada actually withdrew after ratifying, there is no penalty and there aren't penalties uh, in international law. And that's not how it works. Um, it works through international pressure. It, uh, I mean, one of the brilliant pieces of diplomacy on the part of the French at Paris was they broke with a long-standing tradition of at these two-week negotiations. Uh, they start and the officials have these negotiations which go on furiously and stressfully and so on and so forth. But the, the, the leaders turn up on the last day or maybe the last two days. The presidents and prime ministers fly in as they did at Copenhagen and they're supposed to wrap everything up and sign an agreement. But what we saw happen at Copenhagen is they turned up there was no agreement, there was no time, the officials, you know, would leave all the important decisions and it collapsed. Whereas what the French did, not only did they do a lot of pre-diplomacy, um, they asked all of the leaders to come on the first day. And all of the leaders came on the first day and every one of them had six minutes to make a statement uh, that actually had to have two plenaries uh, so that... Uh, they could all get an opportunity to talk. And every last one of them got up there and made grand statements about how committed they were, how this was important for the future of humanity, and how their nation was committed to the process, and so on. And this sent a very strong message to the officials, who then, for the rest of the two weeks, negotiated. And so I think this um, process, this pressure on nations uh, to, uh, to do the right thing is, is very, very strong. Um, but there's also, but the, you know, as I keep stressing more and more now, th th there's more going on. There's a massive transformation happening within the global community. And, what, and the shift that's happened is that, and this applies, you know, in little old Australia, it's kind of awkward and embarrassing to come back to this country and realise just how disconnected we are from the global debate and what's going on. Um, in Australia, we still have our major corporations saying, well, you know, we'll only respond when we have to. Whereas more and more uh, corporations, um, including fossil fuel corporations overseas, such as the European fossil fuel companies who are now calling for a global carbon tax, are saying, we don't want to be forced to do what we, what we don't want to do. We want to be out there leading it because we can see that the world is changing. And so I think um, there's just this momentum that has now uh, been set in train uh, that will drive emission reductions in, in the future. Now, I'm going to be really unfair and ask you two simple questions 
about which you've written whole books. Um, and it's unfair to, for you to have to speak uh, succinctly about questions that are occupied about books. You're going to ask about geoengineering, aren't you? Yeah, I was going to ask you about <laughs> geoengineering. One of Clive's books is Earth Masters, which is a critique, a very, um, on balance, a very um, passionate critique yes. of the dangers that geoengineering, particular, yes. in particular, the putting sulphur in the atmosphere yes. to stop the sun's yes. rays having their yes. effect. Could you, for this audience, to say why you're so worried, anxious I about am. the likelihood of it, it, geoengineering becoming more important if Paris doesn't succeed. There were, incidentally, uh, attempts behind the scenes to insert a kind of endorsement of geoengineering into the Paris Agreement, uh, attempts that had to be headed off. Um, let me try and be as concise as I, I can. There are a whole range of geoengineering techniques, but the kind of headline one is, as you mentioned, known as sulphate aerosol spraying. It's known uh, from studying volcanoes that if a large amount of particulate matter, is, a very large amount, is put into the atmosphere, then the Earth cools because less sunlight gets through to the surface of the Earth. And so the proposal is to mimic vo a large volcanic eruptions by sending up a fleet of planes and spraying uh, in the stratosphere a layer of sulphate aerosols that would coat the whole Earth and depending on its thickness uh, reduce the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth and thereby cool the Earth and it could be quite easily done cool the Earth by a degree, two degrees, you know, you can basically have a global thermostat. It would work, it would be cheap, it could be done unilaterally. Do I need to go on about the kind of risks involved? Of course, you're not dealing with um, climate change, you're dealing with one symptom, that is global warming, it does nothing for ocean acidification and other changes in the weather. As soon as you take away the sun shield, then you get this massive spike uh, of global warming, which would be catastrophic. Um, and who knows what geo geopolitical circumstances might cause a nation or group of nations to stop spraying the atmosphere, what if it has the kind of desired effects over China or the United States, but it, uh, uh, it stops the Indian monsoon, which some of the climate models say, so there's famine in India as a result of China trying to protect itself. Uh, you can imagine the kind of geopolitical con conflicts this might uh, set up. So it's a kind of grand, the grandest Promethean ambition that humanity ever had to take control of the Earth system uh, through this relatively simple, rather crude technological uh, intervention. And so that, along with the um, a serious risk that this kind, the appeal of this kind of geoengineering scheme to political leaders, such as uh, Republicans in the United States, to avoid all of this uh, government intervention, to uh, destroy the American way of life and impose an impost on fossil fuel companies, big government, instead will go to geoengineering. And so there are so many risks and dangers associated with it. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of approach that makes me uh, very, very and scared. Do you think it's gaining momentum? There are a bunch of scientists and right-wing think tanks uh, who support the idea in the United States, the same right-wing think tanks that have for years denied that climate change exists, now saying, hey, uh, sulphate aerosol spraying is the kind of answer we think we can live with. Uh, I know that in the back offices of Republicans on Capitol Hill, they're talking seriously about geoengineering. Uh, I know that our own uh, uh, environment minister has privately said he likes the idea of geoengineering. Um, and basically, it's, it's kind of something that uh, is, going to be, is, is going to be a solution to be put, put into the back pocket and pulled out when things get really bad. And you can paint kinds of scenarios, China 2035, uh, there's a, the, the weather's gone really bad, there's a terrible <coughs> drought, famine threatens, huge social unrest. Uh, the, the grip of the Chinese Communist Party on power is seriously destabilised. Let's engineer the climate. It's the only solution. We know it will cool the climate within a matter of months. Uh, it won't cost much. Sure, India might not like it, but, you know, it's this or nothing. I mean, I think that kind of scenario 
is not impossible. My final question, then I have Liz to come up. Um, for some reason, two sort of ideas have always struck me as interesting about what might play a role in helping solve the crisis. One comes from um, the former uh, head of Greenpeace, um, Paul Gilding, who thinks, who in a, in a rather apocalyptic moment in one of his books, I think The Great Disruption, he says, suddenly the penny will drop. There will be this thing he calls the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening is essentially these suited men you talked about. The Great Awakening will, ha will happen amongst the elites of the developed world. They'll suddenly see that without dramatic action, this generation will be responsible for the destruction of the one and only Earth we have. Mm -hmm. One idea. The other idea comes from Naomi Klein, who's only recently joined this issue, but has joined it with enormous um, vitality uh, and effect. And her idea is the only thing that might save us is this virtual community across the globe she calls Blockadia. Um, the, the, and this really is an entree to Liz, who's not only a scholar but also a climate activist, that, that the action, particularly of young people, fighting the corporations is, uh, I, I think she would think, our best hope. Uh, just a brief response to the great awakening of Paul Gilding or blockadia of Naomi Klein. Well, you know, uh, my heart is with blockadia. Um, I think it has a, a certain kind of utopian element to it, particularly the appeal to indigenous people. I, mean, I, I have a lot of problem with this, that you know, in, indigenous people in their traditional ways are going to somehow sort of, they're going to be the ones that will save us. You know, quite apart from, you know, sorry indigenous people, we screwed the world and now we want you to help us save it. And the kind of ethics of that. Uh, but um, I'm also uh, a little bit wary of, of talk about the Great Awakening, which has this kind of um, uh, um, Tillard de Chardin quality to it or something like that. Um, but, you know, if the Great Awakening is interpreted in terms of the, you know, the suits that I talked about who turned up at Le Bourget in droves because, you know, they came out of their glass offices in, in the city or in Wall Street or, or, or Shanghai and came to Paris for the first time and said, this climate change problem is not a side issue that we can, you know, that green bonds will deal with. This actually affects our core business. We can now see, and they've only seen it, I'd suggest, in most of them in the last year or two at most, this, this, this is telling us something profound about how the world is changing, and as investors, we simply have to get on top of this. Uh, so This is a sort of practical version of Great Awakening. It is, but I don't want, you know, but I think the climate campaigners have been really kind of fundamental in bringing about that shift because they've had a very big impact not only on technological development, because some early tech people have seen uh, the way the world is going, but also on the, on the political uh, process. And so um, the NGOs have fought, uh, the clim climate camp campaigners in all their various stripes have, have fought a very long and mostly very dispiriting, uh, but at times hopeful and effective uh, campaign. And the divestment campaign, I think, has been, uh, which Bill McKibben has, uh, has led, has been an extremely important influence. The impact, the pressure on global banks not to fund, fund fossil fuel developments has been uh, highly effective, long way to go, but highly effective. And I should, uh, let me just finish on this last point. And uh, that is about the Galilee Basin, uh, which is a kind of, you know, it's, it's almost inconceivable that Australian governments, federal and state, could at this time still actively be encouraging the opening up of these vast new uh, coal fields to development. I mean, it's madness from every point of view. And um, if it does get closer to uh, uh, an, an actuality, uh, if they start moving the bulldozers into 
those coal mines uh, first proposed, particularly the Adani one, the Carmichael mine in the Galilee Basin. I think what we'll see is the biggest, uh, most passionate protest movement that has ever happened in Australia. Right. Well, can you hear me? So I, I do enjoy, indeed, uh, join the panel as an activist. I was in Paris as a um, climate guardian angel, and we were trying to use art and spectacle to circumvent the kind of rational blocks that seem to be in play in public perception around climate. So I have a big focus on public perception. But I think that out of everything you said, the thing that before I open up to, to you all to, to ask more questions, the thing that I'm just wondering about is what, what is your response to the kind of latest quite alarming spikes in temperature? Is it a kind of temporary response to the Indonesian fires? It seems to me very confusing and very concerning that not only was January the hottest month on record by a wide margin, but but climate scientists are now saying things like it's jaw-dropping, they're tweeting things like, wow, they're not given to a mode of expression, and there seems to be a kind of a new set of data before us that we need to respond to. How can you assimilate that with your understanding of how things are unfolding? It's very frightening what's happening. Uh, the uh, Mauna Loa uh, uh, emissions measures, concentration measures, the spike in global temperature, uh, which we've all experienced, haven't we, in, in, in February. It's kind of uh, quite, quite frightening and, um, and unusual. And, um, I mean, how do I respond? I say, you know, I, I'm extremely anxious that what we're going to see, I mean, if you look at the temperature record over the last couple of hundred years, you'll see, you know, it, it, it's never smooth. And I am worried that the, the kind of hidden heat mm. uh, that we know is somewhere in the Earth's system mm. because uh, <coughs> concentrations have been increasing continually over the last uh, 15, 20, 30 years, that the kind of hidden heat that wasn't being manifested in the atmosphere is now starting to manifest itself mm. uh, because it's been... You know, it's, it's, it's come out of other parts of the Earth system, particularly the oceans. I mean, of course, it's complicated because we've yep. had this very strong El Nino event, mm. uh, and so we've had warming plus El Nino, which has given rise to this temperature spike. But, you know, you know when I'm lying awake at, at night, you know, I'm, what terrifies me is that what we're seeing is a kind of, you know, the so-called pause. You know, it came in a way at the worst possible time, because it, because it coincided with denialism. Mm. And it gave them this kind of veneer of kind of credibility. Mm. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, it's no, it's no good us, you know, now, now that the world, world system, the Earth system's gone crazy, well, you know, screw you, you were wrong all the time. I mean, it's not kind of any satisfaction. Mm. So, you know, we just have to kind of live with it. We have to listen to the, what the climate scientists are saying. We have to hope that the kind of messages of, of, of the Earth system itself and the climate scientists are going to reinforce this shift that's happened and, um, you know, hope that the, the, the turning point that I, I've identified does result in a, in a, a, a peak in global emissions and, and more particularly, not so much the peak, I'm more worried about the rate of decline thereafter. Mm. Okay. which is, thank you, Robert, for organising this really <coughs> profound evening of catching up on this very confusing set of circumstances and, you know, geopolitical interactions with geomorphologies, and it's extremely confusing, so it's wonderful to have Clive clarify some of that for us tonight. And rather cheekily as the chair, I'm just going to finish with a note on the blockadia and what you were saying about the Indigenous, you know, the cynicism around the Indigenous stuff. There's a really remarkable coalition between Indigenous and farmers and, uh, you know, younger generations being involved. And I will just take you up on that to finish. 
that last point, one of the points you made, that if the Carmichael mine goes ahead, it will be a bigger galvanisation and mobilisation than possibly even the Franklin Dam. Yes, I think so. And that's something to think about. And if you're interested in getting involved, I'd bring um, Friends of the Earth. They're very involved in organising these blockades. So on that note, <laughs> thank you all for coming. And um, welcome to the Anthropocene. Thank <laughs> you.